Ahmad ibn Taymiyyah known as ibn Taymiyyah was either Kurdish or according to some opinions Arab Islamic scholar, theologian and logician. He lived during the troubled times of the Mongol invasions, much of the time in Damascus. He was a member of the school founded by Ahmad ibn Hanbal and is considered by his followers, along with ibn Qudamar, as one of the two most significant proponents of Hanbalism. In the modern era, his adherents often refer to the two as the two sheikhs, and ibn Taymiyyah in particular as Sheikh al-Islam. Ibn Taymiyyah sought the return of Sunni Islam to what he viewed as earlier interpretations of the Quran and the Sunnah, and is considered to have had considerable influence in contemporary Wahhabism, Salafism, and Jihadism. He is renowned for his fatwa issued against the Mongol rulers declaring jihad by Muslims against him compulsory, on the grounds that they did not follow Sharia and as such were not Muslim, their claims to have converted to Islam notwithstanding. His teachings had a profound influence on Muhammad ibn Abd al-Warab and other later Wahhabi scholars. Name Ibn Taymiyyah's full name is Taki ad-Din Abu al-Abbas Ahmad ibn Abd al-Alim ibn Abdusalam ibn Abd Allah ibn al-Khidr ibn Muhammad ibn al-Khidr ibn Ali ibn Abd Allah ibn Taymiyyah al-Araini. Ibn Taymiyyah's name is unusual in that it is derived from a female member of his family as opposed to a male member, which was the normal custom at the time and still is now. Taymiyyah was a woman, famous for her scholarship and piety and the name Ibn Taymiyyah was taken up by many of her male descendants. Overview Ibn Taymiyyah had a simple life, most of which he dedicated to learning, writing, and teaching. He never married nor did he have a female companion throughout his years. Al-Matrudi says that this may be why he was able to engage fully with the political affairs of his time without holding any official position such as that of a judge. An offer of an official position was made to him but he never accepted. His life was that of a religious scholar and a political activist. In his efforts he was persecuted and imprisoned on six different occasions with the total time spent inside prison coming to over six years. Other sources say that he spent over 12 years in prison. His detentions were due to certain elements of his creed and his views on some jurisprudential issues. However according to Yahya Michot, the real reasons were more trivial. Michot gives five reasons as to why Ibn Taymiyyah was imprisoned, they being not complying with the doctrines and practices prevalent among powerful religious and Sufi establishments, an overly outspoken personality, the jealousy of his peers, the risk to public order due to this popular appeal and political intrigues. Baba Johansson, a professor at the Harvard Divinity School says that the reasons for Ibn Taymiyyah's incarcerations were, as a result of his conflicts with Muslim mystics, jurists, and theologians, who were able to persuade the political authorities of the necessity to limit Ibn Taymiyyah's range of action through political censorship and incarceration. Ibn Taymiyyah's own relationship as a religious scholar with the ruling apparatus, who did deviate in application of Sharia law, was not always amicable. It ranged from silence to open rebellion. On occasions when he shared the same views and aims as the ruling authorities, his contributions were welcomed but when Ibn Taymiyyah went against the status quo, he was seen as uncooperative and on occasions spent much time in prison. Ibn Taymiyyah's attitude towards his own rulers was based on the actions of the companions when they made an oath of allegiance to the Islamic prophet Muhammad as follows, to obey within, obedience to God, even if the one giving the order is unjust, to abstain from disputing the authority of those who exert it, and to speak out the truth, or take up its cause without fear in respect of God, a blame from anyone, early years. Background Ibn Taymiyyah was born in 1263 in Haran into a well-known Arabian family of theologians. His father had the Hanbali chair in Haran and later at the Great Mosque of Damascus. His tribal root origin from Bani Namir, a tribe from the Arabian Peninsula, 
Harran was a city part of the Sultanate of Rum. Now Harran is a small city on the border of Syria and Turkey, currently in Samlia for province of modern-day Turkey, a place to which Moses was reportedly sent to provide guidance. Before its destruction by the Mongols, Harran was also well known since the early days of Islam for its Hanbali school and tradition, to which Ibn Taymiyyah's family belonged. His grandfather, Abu al-Barqash Majdad-din Ibn Taymiyyah al-Hanbali and his uncle, Faik al-Din were reputable scholars of the Hanbali school of law. Likewise, the scholarly achievements of Ibn Taymiyyah's father, Shihab al-Din, Abd al-Halim Ibn Taymiyyah were also well known. According to Ibn Taymiyyah, non-Arab Muslims are inferior to Arab Muslims. Immigration to Damascus in 1269, Ibn Taymiyyah at the age of seven together with his father and three brothers left the city of Haran which was completely destroyed by the ensuing Mongol invasion. Ibn Taymiyyah's family moved and settled in Damascus, Syria, which at the time was ruled by the Mamluks of Egypt. Education in Damascus His father served as the director of the Sukhariya Madrasa, a place where Ibn Taymiyyah also received his early education. Ibn Taymiyyah acquainted himself with the religious and secular sciences of his time. His religious studies began in his early teens, when he committed the entire Quran to memory and later on came to learn the Islamic disciplines of the Quran. From his father he learnt the religious science of fiqh and usul al-fiqh. Ibn Taymiyyah learnt the works of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, al-Khalil, ibn Qudamar and also the works of his grandfather, Abu al-Barakat Majdad-Din. His study of jurisprudence was not limited to the Hanbali tradition but he also learnt the other schools of jurisprudence. The number of scholars under which he studied hadith is said to number more than 204 of whom were women. Those who are known by name amount to 40 hadith teachers, as recorded by Ibn Taymiyyah in his book called Darbabak-Un Hadithin. Siraj ul Haq says, based on this, Ibn Taymiyyah started to hear hadith from the age of five. One of his teachers was the first Hanbali chief justice of Syria, Shams Ud Din al Makdizi, who held the newly created position instituted by Baybars as part of a reform of the judiciary. Al Makdizi later on came to give Ibn Taymiyyah permission to issue Fatama when he became a Mufti at the age of 17. Ibn Taymiyyah's secular studies led him to devote attention to Arabic language and Arabic literature by studying Arabic grammar and lexicography. Under Ali ibn Abd al Qawi al Tuft, he went on to master the famous book of Arabic grammar, al Kitab, by the Persian grammarian Sibiwayhi. He also studied mathematics, algebra, calligraphy, theology, philosophy, history, and heresiography. The knowledge he gained from history and philosophy, he used to refute the prevalent philosophical discourses of his time, one of which was Aristotelian philosophy. Ibn Taymiyyah learnt about Sufism and stated that he had reflected on the works of Sal al-Tustari, Junaid of Baghdad, Abu Talib al-Maki, Abdul Qadir Gilani, Abu Haf Sumar al Surawadi, and Ibn Arabi. At the age of 20 in the year 1282, Ibn Taymiyyah completed his education, life as a scholar. After his father died in 1284, he took up the then vacant post as the head of the Sukhariya Madrasa and began giving lessons on hadith. A year later he started giving lessons, as chair of the Hanbali Zawiya on Fridays at the Mayyad Mosque, on Fridays, on the subject of Tafsir. In November 1292, Ibn Taymiyyah performed the Hajj and when he returned four months later, he wrote his first book aged 29 called Manashik al-Hajj, in which he criticized and condemned the bidders which he saw take place there. Ibn Taymiyyah represented the Hanbali school of thought during this time. The Hanbali school was seen as the most traditional school out of the four legal systems because it was suspicious of the Hellenist disciplines of philosophy and speculative theology. He remained faithful throughout his life to this school, whose doctrines he had mastered, but he nevertheless called for it had and discouraged Taklid. 
relationship with authorities of Antemia's emergence into the public and political sphere began in 1293 at the age of 30, when he was asked by the authorities to give an Islamic legal verdict on Asaf al-Nazrana, a Christian cleric accused of insulting the Islamic prophet Muhammad. He accepted the invitation and delivered his fatwa, calling for the man to receive the death penalty, despite the fact that public opinion was very much on Ibn Taymiyyah's side. The governor of Syria attempted to resolve the situation by asking Asaf to accept Islam in return for his life, to which he agreed. This resolution was not acceptable to Ibn Taymiyyah who then, together with his followers, protested outside the governor's palace demanding Asaf be put to death, on the grounds that any person, Muslim or non-Muslim, who insults Muhammad must be killed. This unwillingness to compromise coupled with his attempt to protest against the governor's actions, resulted in him being punished with a prison sentence, the first of many such imprisonments to come. The French Orientalist Henry Lauest says that during this incarceration Ibn Taymiyyah wrote his first great work, Al-Saram al-Masl al shatim al-Rasul, Ibn Taymiyyah, together with the help of his disciples, continued with his efforts against what he perceived to be un-Islamic practices and to implement what he saw as his religious duty of commanding good and forbidding wrong. Yahya Michot says that some of these incidences included shaving children's heads, leading an anti-debauchery campaign in brothels and taverns, hitting an atheist before his public execution, destroying what was thought to be a sacred rock in a mosque attacking astrologers and obliging deviant Sufi sheikhs to make public acts of contrition and to adhere to the Sunnah. Ibn Taymiyyah and his disciples used to condemn wine cellars and they would attack wine shops in Damascus by breaking wine bottles and pouring them onto the floor. A few years later in 1296, he took over the position of one of his teachers taking the post of Professor of Hanbali Jurisprudence at the Hanbali Madrasa, the oldest such institution of this tradition in Damascus. This is seen by some to be the peak of his scholarly career. The year he began his post at the Hanbali Madrasa was a time of political turmoil. The Mamluk Sultan al adil Kitbuffer was deposed by his vice Sultan al-Malik al Manselajin, who then ruled from 1297 to 1299. Lajan had a desire to commission an expedition against the Christians of the Armenian Kingdom of Cilicia who formed an alliance with the Mongol Empire and taking part of the military campaign which led to the destruction of Baghdad the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate and Haran the birth place of Ibn Taymiyyah. For that purpose he urged Ibn Taymiyyah to call the Muslims to jihad. In 1298 Ibn Taymiyyah wrote an explanation of the Ayat al-Mutashabiyat called al-Bakrotakidat al-Hamawayat al-Kubra. The book is about divine attributes and it served as an answer to a question from the city of Hama, Syria. At that particular time Asharites held prominent positions within the Islamic scholarly community in both Syria and Egypt, and they held a certain position on the divine attributes of God. Ibn Taymiyyah in his book strongly disagreed with their views and this heavy opposition to the common Asharari position caused considerable controversy. Ibn Taymiyyah collaborated once more with the Mamluks in 1300, when he joined the expedition against the Alawites, in the Kisrawan region of the Lebanese mountains. Ibn Taymiyyah thought of the Alawites as more heretical yet than Jews and Christians, and according to Karel Hillenbrand, the confrontation with the Shias resulted because they were accused of collaboration with Christians and Mongols. Ibn Taymiyyah had further active involvements in campaigns against the Mongols and their Shia allies. Second expedition against the Alawites Ibn Taymiyyah took part in a second military offensive in 1305 against the Alawites and the Ismabak Crotillis in the Khosrowan region of the Lebanese mountains where they were defeated. The Alawites eventually left the region to settle in southern Lebanon. Involvement in Mongol invasion 
First invasions The first invasion took place between December 1299 and April 1300 due to the military campaign by the Mamluks against the Armenian Kingdom of Cilicia who were allied with the Mongols. The Ilkhanate army managed to reach Damascus by the end of December 1299. Ibn Taymiyyah went with a delegation of Islamic scholars to talk to Ghazan Khan, who was the Khan of the Mongol Ilkhanate of Iran, to plead clemency and to stop his attack on the Muslims. It is reported that none of the scholars said anything to the Khan except Ibn Taymiyyah who said, You claim that you are Muslim and you have with you Mu'addans, Muftis, Imams and Sheikhs but you invaded us and reached our country for what? While your father and your grandfather, Hulagu were non-believers, they did not attack and they kept their promise. But you promised and broke your promise by early January 1300 the Mongol allies, the Armenians and Georgians, had caused widespread damage to Damascus and they had taken Syrian prisoners. The Mongols effectively occupied Damascus for the first four months of 1303. Most of the military had fled the city, including most of the civilians. Ibn Taymiyyah however, stayed and was one of the leaders of the resistance inside Damascus and he went to speak directly to the Mongol Ilkhan Mahmud Ghazan and his vizier, Rashid al-Din Tabab. He sought the release of Muslim and Dhimmi prisoners which the Mongols had taken in Syria, and after discussion, secured their release. Second Mongol invasion The second invasion lasted between October 1300 and January 1301. Ibn Taymiyyah at this time began giving sermons on jihad at the Umayyad Mosque. Ibn Taymiyyah also spoke to and encouraged the governor of Damascus, Al-Afram to achieve a victory against the Mongols. He became involved with Al-Afram once more, when he was sent to get reinforcements from Cairo. Third Invasion and Fatwa The year 1303 saw the Third Mongol Invasion of Syria by Ghazan Khan. What has been called Ibn Taymiyyah's most famous fatwa was issued against the Mongols in the Mamluks War. Ibn Taymiyyah declared that jihad against the Mongol attack on the Malmuk Sultanate was not only permissible, but obligatory. The reason being that the Mongols could not, in his opinion, be true Muslims despite the fact that they had converted to Sunni Islam because they ruled using what he considered man-made law s rather than Islamic law or Sharia. Because of this, he reasoned they were living in a state of jihiliya or pre-Islamic pagan ignorance. The fatwa broke new Islamic legal ground because no jurist had ever before issued a general authorization for the use of lethal force against Muslims in battle, and was to influence modern Islamists in the use of violence against self-proclaimed Muslims. Ibn Taymiyyah called on the Muslims to jihad once again and he also personally joined the eventual Battle of Marj al-Safar against the Mongol army. The battle began on 20 April of that year. On the same day, Ibn Taymiyyah declared a fatwa which exempted Mamluk soldiers from the fast during the month of Ramadan so that they could maintain their strength. Within two days the Mongols were severely defeated and the battle was won. Facing charges against his literalism, Ibn Taymiyyah was imprisoned several times for conflicting with the IJMA of jurists and theologians of his day. From the city of Warzit, Iraq, a judge requested that Ibn Taymiyyah write a book on creed which led to him writing his book, for which he faced troubles, called Al-Aqidar al-Wazishiya, a work on his view of the creed of the Salaf which included reference to the divine attributes of God. Ibn Taymiyyah adopted the view that God should be described as he was literally described in the Quran and in the Hadith and that all Muslims were required to believe this because it was the view held by the early Muslim community. This created problems for the Islamic scholars of the time as it meant they all had to adhere to it. Within the space of two years four separate religious council hearings were held to assess the correctness of his creed. 1305 hearing The first hearing was held with the Shafi'i scholars who accused Ibn Taymiyyah of anthropomorphism. At the time, Ibn Taymiyyah was 42 years old. He was protected by the then governor of Damascus, Akush al-Afram, during the proceedings. 
the scholars suggested that he accept that his creed was simply that of the Hanbalites and offered this as a way out of the charge, the issue being, if Ibn Taymiyyah ascribed his creed to the Hanbali school of law then it would be just one view out of the four schools which one could follow rather than a creed everybody must adhere to. Ibn Taymiyyah was uncompromising and maintained that it was obligatory for all scholars to adhere to his creed. 1306 hearings and imprisonment Two separate councils were held a year later on 22 and 28 of January 1306. The first council was in the house of the governor of Damascus Akush al Afram, who had protected him the year before when facing the Shafi'i scholars. A second hearing was held six days later where the Indian scholar Safi al-Din al-Hindi found him innocent of all charges and accepted that his creed was in line with the Quran and the Sunnah. Regardless, in April of 1306 the chief Islamic judges of the Mamluk state declared Ibn Taymiyyah guilty and he was incarcerated. He was released four months later in September. Further objections after release After his release in Damascus, the doubts regarding his creed seemed to have resolved but this was not the case. A Shafi'i scholar, Ibn al-Sasari, was insistent on starting another hearing against Ibn Taymiyyah which was held once again at the house of the governor of Damascus, al-Afram. His book Al-Aqidah al-Wazishia was still not found at fault. At the conclusion of this hearing, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn al-Sasari were sent to Cairo to settle the problem.